The time for testing this week in schools everywhere, well, maybe not everywhere, but here in Milton at least, is over. That's a weak, weak response from the children that have just gone through the testing. Oh my word. Yeah, the teachers. Where the, where's the response from the teachers? Yeah. Hallelujah. It is a cause for celebration and we do celebrate with you who have crossed the finish line. Congratulations. Now we know that it hasn't always been smooth sailing. And I have a, a little story here to illustrate that for us this morning. A mother was seeing her eight-year-old son off to school one morning. She walked him to the bus stop where they waited patiently. And the bus came and her son got on the school bus. And mom proceeded to go home so she could get ready to go to work. About 15 minutes later, the doorbell rang and it was her son at the front door. She was shocked to see him since she just got him on the school bus and then she noticed that the school bus was out in front of the house with its doors open. The mother asked the son, what are you doing back home? Her eight-year-old son said, I'm quitting school. It's too hard, it's too boring, and it's too long. Don't get any ideas, eight-year-olds. So the mother looked back at him right in the eyes and said, that's life, kid. Now get back on the bus. When you go through challenges and difficulties in life, sometimes the only answer is get back on the bus. You got to go through it. The nice thing about uh, education in our schools is we can look at things like finish lines and graduations. But the same can't be said about the tests that we face in life. As long as we live in this world, we know that we will have tests. Now that's just another nicer way of saying that we get trials, tribulations, and troubles. We are stretched, and we are pulled and prodded and pressed and stressed and fearful and overwhelmed. Because as our Lord so accurately described in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. In the first few lines of his letter to the Jewish believers scattered all over the world in the middle of the first century, Pastor James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, pointed them to their great need for spiritual endurance. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, perseverance or endurance is crucial for competing in a sport. But the need for endurance as a follower of Christ is even more important because we need it for every part and every stage of life. Endurance is what you build up when you go through struggles and trials which test your faith. In other words, we gain endurance only because of trouble. Have you thought about that? God gives us tests not so that we can fail, but so that we can have the satisfaction of knowing that we have succeeded by trusting Him through it all. As that old Andre Crouch song says, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend on His Word. How do you learn to depend on God's Word? You go through trouble. The troubles that we have really boil down to our environment. We live in a world where the desires of the sinful nature and the results of the sinful nature wreak havoc in our life. Sometimes, We ourselves are the cause of this trouble. Sometimes we bring trouble on ourselves because we make poor decisions. Sometimes trouble just happens upon us. Try as we may to avoid trouble and pain and suffering, it always finds us because it is woven into the fabric of this earthly life. Remember what that fount of wisdom, the dread pirate Wesley from the Princess Bride said? 
Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. We fight against our own internal bent towards sinning, yes, but even if we were completely free of the tendency to live for what is displeasing to God, we would not be free from the weight of sin in this world. Consider this. The Lord Jesus was completely free from sin and pleasing to God in every way, and yet he faced the struggles of living in a world that was full of sin. This is what our passage from Hebrews chapter 12 this morning says. And so I want to invite you to turn to that. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. I'm going to read this for us. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder of and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Everyone who follows Jesus needs spiritual endurance because life is hard. And we get weary from the struggle. But we have the example of our Lord Jesus. And if we can learn from that, we will be able to keep from falling off the pace of this spiritual race that God has set in front of us. Since the Lord has already walked down the path, He's already run the race that we are running, He can be our example and our inspiration. And not only do we have the Lord's example, we have the example of people of faith who've gone on before us, those whom Hebrews chapter 11 points out, as well as those whom we have learned from in our lives, maybe who have uh, already gone to be with the Lord, or maybe those who are older in faith that God has placed in our lives. They have run the race that we are running, and they have endured. From them we can gain courage that we need to face the problems of every day. So I have a couple of points that I wanted to bring out from our passage this morning. And the first is to be encouraged by people of faith. Be encouraged by people of faith. Hebrews 11, they call it the hall of faith. Have you ever noticed that the people in Hebrews 11 were people that had big problems? They're highlighted for their faith in God, but if you were actually to look through their stories, you might be shocked that they had problems even worse than your problems. In fact, they're big sinners. Amen? They're big time sinners, just like you and me. No amens on that one? Come on, guys. You with me? It's too hot in here. Woo! Big time sinner right here, baby. Come on, get real, people. We are big time sinners, but guess what? We got a bigger God. Amen. These people that we're looking at as examples are not superheroes. Most of them were, had pretty, pretty big time problems. Abraham, for instance, he doubted God and twice put his wife into the arms of another man. I just want to point out this guy is called the father of faith. If you were to put your wife into the arms of another man, we'd have a serious conversation on that, right? This guy is called the father of faith. He had big-time problems. Noah built an ark and then disgraced himself and brought about the cursing of an entire people group. If you've not read that, go ahead and read it. An entire people group were cursed because of Noah's sin. That's big time. Jacob the one whose name was changed to Israel. Jacob was known as a deceiver. Let me put that in the current vernacular. Everybody knew that Jacob was a liar. Everybody knew that. They called him the liar. That's the name for him. Moses brought about the most awesome miracles that have been recorded in in history. And then 
got mad and decided to play the part of God and he missed the promised land. God said, you can't go in because you blew it. David broke his marriage vow and the consequence was not only the death of his son, but civil war in the nation of Israel. These people of faith were sinners and they lived in a sin-infested world just like us and yet, and yet, they learned to trust in God. And so they give us hope because we also can learn through it all to trust in God. In the day to day, ins and outs, ups and downs of real life, yes, we can live by faith. You don't have to be a super Christian. You just need to take one day, one moment at a time, and walk with God and do what he shows you to do. I love Micah 6, 8. Because it really highlights what is our responsibility. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To walk with the Lord requires endurance. And so let us be encouraged by those who have gone on before us and been an example of our faith to be able to give us courage to face the hurdles of the day that we go through. Two weeks ago, I encouraged you all to pray for one another so that the desires of the sinful nature wouldn't maintain a stronghold on us. I pointed out that this is a prayer that the Lord answers with a resounding yes. When we pray for each other along this way, God says yes. And I want to give you some additional specific areas to pray for each other in addition to applying them to your own life so that you can Walk through life in faith and avoid the snare of the sinful nature which tries to weigh us down and causes us to be weary and faint-hearted. If we are to run the race of our lives with spiritual endurance, it helps if we get rid of some things that are weighing us down. You don't want to carry anything more than you need to when you're running a race. And sometimes in the spiritual race that we're running we can't see that we're being weighed down. And so I want to point out three areas which I have found to be especially heavy in people's lives and work overtime against the goal of trusting in God. The first one is anger. If you're a human being, you have experienced anger. We all get angry from time to time, but we each respond to anger differently. Some people respond by stuffing their anger deep down. On the outside, they don't appear to be angry, but rest assured, anger will come out sooner or later, and usually it blows like a volcano, and there are casualties everywhere. Other people respond by giving full vent to their anger at the moment that they are feeling it. Typically, they release anger, and it doesn't continue to bother them, except the people they vented their anger on now have to deal with hurt and pain. Some people deal with anger by ignoring it. They move on to happier thoughts. They think that if they just ignore it, at some point it will all go away. Now, of course, none of these responses are the best solution. The Bible tells us, Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. If we are angry and because of that anger we harm others and sin, we need to understand this is displeasing to God. Romans 13.10 tells us that love does no harm to a neighbor. Oftentimes we excuse our anger thinking that we have the right to let it fly, but this is the perspective of the world. It's not the perspective of the kingdom of God. In the kingdom, we must be aware that our displeasing actions to God can cause harm to other people. If we're to be true disciples who follow the Lord Jesus We must come out of the way the world operates. We must separate ourselves from this kind of thinking behavior. And we must release anger. If we're holding on to anger, we're really telling the Lord that we know better than He does. He's the one who said, Matthew 5.20, Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now, such an anger in the Lord's eyes is a serious thing. And we must become serious about dealing with it if we are to follow him. The antidote to anger, thankfully, is forgiveness. 
Letting it go brings healing. But I want to tell you that as a pastor over many years, I have watched people who have walked through the act of forgiveness and yet they are still having a hard time with anger. And if that is the case in your life, I want to share a truth with you about your situation. You are injured and you need to be healed. In the same way that a wound that is infected needs to be cleaned out so that healing can begin, you need to be treated for an infection that's a spiritual of nature. No, it's not pleasant. And I can't promise you that the process of healing will all be butterflies and unicorns. I don't have that to offer you this morning. If, I can promise you this. If you don't get help, if you don't get healing in this area, it will come out and you will continue to suffer and you will also harm other people. As Pastor Rod Henry used to say, hurting people hurt people. Our restoration ministry specializes in addressing internal, emotional, and spiritual wounds. If you are hurting, if you have been in a place where you've not uh, be, been able to come free from the anger and you've been working on forgiveness, then let me suggest that this is the path that you need to take. Talk to me. Let us help you take a step in the healing process. The second weight that tends to weigh us down is the weight of fear. And again, if you're a human being, you know what it means to be afraid. In the same way that people respond differently to anger, we also respond differently to fear. Some people respond to fear by looking for every possible bad scenario to happen. Just like Eeyore is always looking and expecting terrible things to happen, this response cripples our ability to go anywhere or experience life because we are looking for the demon behind every bush. We're looking for the problem in every opportunity. Other people respond to fear by seeking out every possible way that they could be harmed and uh, uh, plotting their escape route. Is this your response to fear? Rather than being uh, debilitated, they plan life out to the nth degree so they can avoid the thing to be afraid of. Others respond to fear by ignoring its presence. They stick their heads in the sand or in the clouds and they think uh, if they can't see it, it does not exist. Now again, none of these responses is the best course of action. The Bible actually lays out the antidote for fear to us and the antidote for fear is love. 1 John 4.18, John writes, there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. If we realize deep down in our heart that the God who runs the universe is a God of love, then we will begin to start on the path to overcoming fear. The foundation of living a life free from fear is to know and experience the unconditional love of God and then to live that love out with others as He pours it into our lives. Now, if fear has a strong hold on you, then knowing, experiencing, and living out God's unconditional love is your answer. You will need help to learn how to live in love instead of fear. But don't worry, you have good company. We all need help with that. Look for a mature brother or sister in Christ to mentor you. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you live in the clutches of fear, you need a spiritual mentor and you need to be part of the small group of believers weekly who are studying the Bible and lifting each other up so that you can walk out of fear and live in the love of Christ. That's my prescription for you. If you would like to talk to me later about that, I can give you some more details. The last weight that I see uh, that uh, believers um, are weighed down by is the weight of shame. Now, last week we saw a video about the effects of shame. Uh, and many of you were really moved by that. The gist of it is that all of us have done things which bring dishonor to our family and to our friends and ultimately to God. Shame causes us to want to hide and run away from deep and personal and meaningful relationships because of that shame. Now, this is what happened the moment that sin entered into the world. I'm not sure if you've uh, looked at the uh, 
first sin with Adam and Eve from this perspective. But uh, in Genesis chapter 3, um, uh, it tells us that Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of God. Let me read uh, uh, what happened later. Um, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This is the effect of shame, is to run away and to hide from the very relationship with God and also with others that we need the most. Shame is a weight that we don't have to carry if we understand an important truth. And I want you to listen to me, especially if shame is something that uh, is a weight that you carry. God loves you, and that love is unconditional. It doesn't matter what you have done. God considers you valuable enough to have given his very life for you. That's how much he thinks about you. And it doesn't matter what you've done, what you believe, where you've been at. He thinks that of you. And God never changes. And so that perspective on you will never change. Romans 5.8 says this. God shows his love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have to hear this with our hearts way deep down. Nothing we have done will keep God from coming after us and finding us, even if we try to run and hide. You need to hear that you are not disposable, that God will never throw you away. This weight is a weight that you don't have to carry. The antidote for shame is grace. Jesus' gift to us was to take our shame on his body on that cross. We were so valuable to him that he gave himself, the greatest and most valuable thing that could ever be given so that we could know how much he loves us. This is his grace, which is truly beyond human uh, ability to comprehend. Shame wants us to think that we are not worthy of being loved. But Jesus despised that thinking and he despised the shame and he took it on himself anyway, and in doing so, he made it possible for us to walk out of shame and into the light of his grace and his presence. Amen? Amen. Now, if you're living under the shame of either something you've done, or maybe something that was done to you, or perhaps just because you don't feel that you're worthy of being loved, you need to let yourself be found. God came after Adam and found Adam. Maybe you're trying to run away, and here's my advice for you. Just stand still. God will find you. Just stop moving. Allow him to come and to touch you and to be with you. Just like Adam and Eve, the Lord is looking for you and he's waiting patiently for you to slow down enough for him to tell you how much he cares about you and how much you mean to him. He wants to set you free if you will let him. Now, anger, fear, and shame are weights which are too heavy for anybody to, to carry and to run this spiritual race with endurance. We can't do it. Letting them go and then not picking them up along the way uh, allows us to be successful in living by faith. It allows us to run this race with endurance. We have a cloud of witnesses who have walked through these things and have gone on before us. We can walk behind them in their footsteps. We can walk in the footsteps of of those who's God, whom God has placed in our lives today. People of, who live by faith and have overcome and endured. Uh, let them be an encouragement to you in your spiritual race. Now the second thing from our passage today that I want you to take with you is to be encouraged by the example of Jesus. We know that in his life the Lord was without sin, but he was exposed to evil for the entirety of his life, just like we are. This evil behavior of the people that he walked on earth with ultimately led to his death. He knew it was coming, and he didn't turn the other way. Instead, he looked forward to it, as our passage says, the joy that was set before him. On the other side of the pain, on the other side of the suffering and the trouble, Jesus looked forward to joy. Now, all trouble ends one way or the other. For those who have confidence in Christ, 
Whatever way our trouble ends for us, we win. Notice that the Lord endured hostility from sinners. Now, isn't that what we face also? In this world, don't we face hostility? We live with injustices that are perpetrated against ourselves. They may be the small kinds of injustices, like the guy who was driving on my side of the road this week and didn't care to move over, and after I honked to him, he gave me some hand signals. Little injustices, right? Not big, but there are big injustices that we face as well. The big kind where legal, severe legal repercussions should have happened, but they didn't. We face jealousy and we get cheated out of what is rightly ours. We face prejudice and arrogance towards ourselves for no reason of our own. In all these things, we're on the receiving end of the consequences of living in a world where the sinful nature has a strong grip on people now we certainly contribute to this ourselves but living in a sinful world gets old we get weary of the daily fight and our courage sometimes we leave to the side when this happens our scripture says look to jesus not only did he look beyond the troubles he faced to the future, he also knows the way because he's traveled it. We can rely on his knowledge. We can rely on the fact that he will walk with us. We can look to him because he knows ultimately everything that we need. He not only was the answer when you first trusted in Christ, he's the answer for you today and he will be the answer for you every day in the future. He continues to be our answer inside of the storm. He is the way through our troubles, whatever our troubles may be. Let me ask you, what was the joy that Jesus looked forward to on the other side of the cross? You and me. That's the joy that Jesus looked to on the other side of the cross. He didn't look to a place without pain. He looked to being able to have relationship with with us if we're going to follow his example we're going to look beyond our troubles on the other side of them to the joy that's set before him and what is the joy that is set before us it is the lord jesus christ he is on the other side of the trouble that you're walking through follow his example and look forward to the joy of the of the fulfillment of the relationship that we will have with him not just for the rest of this life, but for the rest of eternity. What is your story? What is the weight that keeps you from running your race with spiritual endurance? What is troubling you? Share your burden with another trusted brother or sister in Christ and let the Lord lift it from you. Be encouraged by their faith. Let their faith carry you. I guarantee that you will have the chance to return that to either that brother or sister or to somebody else. We need spiritual endurance because the race that we are running is a marathon, not a sprint. Now is the time to get in the race. Now is the time to leave the weights to the side. Now is not the time to give up because the Lord is with us. If you are running a race and you feel that you have run a marathon and you're just weary, let me encourage you this morning. The Lord is here. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are here. Let them encourage you. Let the Lord encourage you to run the race with endurance. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you that uh, you know all that we need and you provided for us in advance. Father, for those that are specifically under the weight and the burden of troubles in this life, Lord, and they feel like they can't get out from the weight, I want to pray for them, Lord God. And I want to pray that not only would you infuse them with strength, Father, but that you infuse them with hope right now, God. That the, the, the message of truth that we've heard, that you will be with them in everything, God. Father, I pray that that would take over their minds and that they would... Uh, uh, push away the clouds of confusion and doubt 
and, um, and hurt and struggle and pain, God, that you would just come on them and fill their minds with this truth, Lord, that you will be with them through all the trouble and you will be there at the finish line as well. I praise you, God, that uh, you have given us the, the truth of joy, Lord, uh, that we can consider it joy because, God, on the other side of our troubles, you are waiting and you walk through with us too. I praise you, God, and, and just give you thanks. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray, amen. <laughs>